The forward to the Africa Progress Report for 2013 had the following sentence by Kofi Annan. Africa is standing on the edge of enormous opportunity. But critics are not convinced. They say Africa is rising, yes, but Africans are not. In the same report, it is revealed that annually, 34 billion US dollars is siphoned out of Africa every year by Western corporations in conjunction with African elites through deals in mining and oil. And not too long ago, there was a headline in the, the Daily Times, one of the dailies here in Malawi. It said, Malawi was going to need 74 years for it to eradicate poverty. When I saw the headline, I thought of the Malawians who have already had their poverty eradicated and those who haven't. I thought of the contradictions that stare you in the face. We have glamorous shopping complexes sitting side by side with dilapidated market squares, only separated by very dusty, fully potholed Devil Street. <laughs> I thought of this particular stretch in Old Town Lilongwe. You've got one of Malawi's best and most successful banks. Next to it is a chain grocery store, and next to that is a very expensive restaurant, and then a mobile phone company, two upscale car dealerships, and then you step outside those buildings and you have this heavily potholed road. And I thought, okay, for some of these, they have had their poverty eradicated, but for the potholes, they need 74 years. <laughs> but these guys, the people in, sitting in our parliament, they don't need 74 years. They have already had theirs eradicated. The optimism, the Afro-optimism that I am envisioning doesn't come from the global headlines that are salivating about deposits of oil and minerals in the soil. Rather, it is Africa-owned. It originates from Africans ourselves. It is a philosophy that we use in Southern Africa. We call it Umuntu in Chichewa, in English, personhood or humanness. It is a philosophy that says, you are, therefore I am. I am not a human being until there is another person. It's because you exist that I exist. And the question I ask myself is, what if we would put Umuntu at the center of our policy formation? To illustrate this, let me tell you a story. In 2010, June, I met with a group of teachers, primary school teachers at Lilongwe Teachers College here in Lilongwe. The idea for the meeting was for us to begin a group where we would meet and share ideas about how to become a better teacher. An even bigger goal was teacher empowerment. How do teachers address the helplessness and the hopelessness they feel about the conditions of school in Malawi, about education in the country? At the end of the meeting, one teacher approached me. His name was Amos Machakaza. He approached me and asked for a ride to a local university. He was a standard four teacher at Lilongwe Demonstration, Teachers, Demonstration School. So I was curious, how are you paying for your degree? You're a primary school teacher. And he told me 90% of his salary went toward his degree program. They even had had their electricity disconnected. He didn't have recourse to a scholarship or a loan or any form of support. They were able to survive only because his wife was also working, another primary school teacher. I went home that night and I tweeted about Amos and what he was going through. I got several responses, but there was one particular response which made a difference. It came from Hastings Fukula Nyeka Nyeka, a friend of mine 
a former classmate of mine from Standard 8 back in the days. Fukula <coughs> promised to support Amos until he finished his degree, and he did. And so in March this year, Amos graduated with his degree in theology. <laughs> he has since enrolled for a master's degree at the same university. And then in November 2012, last year, the Malawi News, a weekly newspaper here, published a story about Mike Demesteb Nkoma. Mike Demesteb Nkoma dropped out of school in Form 1, first year of secondary school in Malawi. He couldn't afford the school fees. His mother had died, and his father was struggling to pay the fees. So he dropped out, and he went to look for a job. He found one as a garden boy. He was working for Juliana Lunguzi, a lecturer at the University of Malawi's Kamos College of Nursing. Juliana saw how brilliant and also how young Mike was, and so she sent him to school. Mike worked very hard, and he finished his education. He scored flying colors. He got three distinctions, one in mathematics, biology, agriculture. And he got selected to the prestigious College of Medicine in the University of Malawi. And so in November last year, Mike graduated as a medical doctor and is now practicing at Malawi's biggest referral hospital, Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital. You already know about the boy who harnessed the wind. He was also dropped out from one school fees, and today we know what he has become. The reason why many Malawians fail to achieve their ambitions is not because they are lazy or because we are a poor country. That may be true, but there is an underlying reason, and it's the assumption we put into policy formulation. We think that intelligence and human potential are fixed and they're limited, that certain people don't have it and they can't go beyond. And so it affects our policy formulation. As an example, we are the only country in the world that I know of that pays students to go to public university, pays them allowances. And as I'm talking, they are on strike. They want more. This morning, there was an item on ZBS on the news bulletin that a high court has, grant, has closed the school indefinitely, I think the Polytechnic and Chancellor College. The only exception, I think, are the students we saw earlier this morning from Chitsanzo's talk, those who are redesigning Limbi. Those students, they definitely need support. They need scholarships. But while we spend these millions of kwacha, on student allowances in public universities. Every year, tens of thousands of Malawians drop out of primary school and secondary school because they can't afford the school fees or the expenses that go with going to school. In 2010, the National Statistics Office released its Malawi Demographic and Health Survey. 2010. In that report, they revealed that 89% of Malawian females aged 18 and above have not attained a secondary school education. For men, the figure is not too different. 82% have not attained a secondary school education. In other words, more than 70% of Malawians aged 18 and above, haven't attained a secondary school education. And we think we know the reasons, but there is an underlying reason we don't discuss very often. It's this assumption about what we think are the limits to human intelligence and human potential. It's a point made in an earlier talk. I think it's the most watched TED talk ever uh, by Sir Ken Robinson. We saw it this morning earlier. But the stories that I've shared with you today 
defy these assumptions. They defy these challenges. They are stories that inspire me and many Malawians. They are stories that make me believe about the coming rebirth of Malawi and of Africa. And they are the reasons why I still believe in Umuntu. Once again, happy Africa Day to all of you. Thank you. <laughs>